Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lima Online, and welcome to yet another special edition of Lima Online. It's our second digital weird talk that we organize in very close collaboration with Arbeit Gallery. And um, they're all here, uh, the organizers of the show and of Arbeit Gallery and our guest of tonight, um, Jan-Robert Leegte, co-curator of the exhibition, Rebecca Edwards from Arbeit Gallery, and Elvia Wilk, our honored guest. Um, so yeah, I would say let's start this night and maybe Jan-Robert, you can start by introducing um, the show to us that is the starting point for all this. Great, thanks so much for hosting this, uh, these two talks. Um, yeah, what about one half a year ago, I, we just sort of rec reconnaissance, uh, 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 Nimrod and Rebecca invited me uh, to create a show with them. And sort of pretty, pretty instantly, I wanted to do something with the topic of the weird and was interested if there was so, such a thing as a digital weird. And knew it from my own practice, I sort of felt intuitively where that could be, but it would be a nice thing to discover. Um, we wanted to make a physical show, which ended up in an online show. It's a scavenger hunt of embedded works in the wild in uh, different sort of platforms uh, online. It, uh, feel free to go to Arbeit, the website, uh, to the Digital Weird page, and maybe we can post it, and uh, you can enjoy the exhibition there. Um, to, um, to provide some context, we organized two talks. A month ago, we talked to Eric Davis. Um, um, Eric and Elvie have both been very sort of provided sort of the, the, the discourse or the, the the, the words to work with this material. It's something I've always been was passionate about, but since Elvia and um, Eric have been really writing a lot, it's, it's become a thing we can actually verbalize, which is, is weird. Um, uh, that is uh, for tonight. So tonight we've invited Elvia. Rebecca will be in conversation with Elvia and I can't wait. So let's get started. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is Rebecca Edwards. I'm the curator of Arbeit Gallery. Um, Arbeit is a digital new media space based in East London and we kind of represent multiple voices in digital culture, work with many different artists using many different technologies, new and old. Um, so before we get into the weird and all of its facets, I'll first introduce our invited speaker, speaker tonight, Elvia Wilk. Elvia Wilk is a writer and editor living in New York. Her first novel, Oval, was published in June June 2019 by Soft School Press and a book of essays called Death by Landscape is forthcoming in 2022 which we're really excited for. Um, she is a recipient of a 2019 Andy Warhol Arts Writers Grant and a 2020 fellowship at the Bergrunen Institute. So yeah thanks for joining us Elvia. Um, so yeah we're here tonight to talk about the weird and some of what that might encompass within the framework of our online exhibition titled The Digital Weird. I will just note that it runs until the 6th of September so you all still have time to see it if you want to experience it. Um, but essentially the exhibition came about through many conversations I had with the co-curator Jan Robert. Um, we're both very much interested in this idea of the weird and how it comes into contact with ontology, but I guess also how it operates as a social thing. Um, so the weird is this undefinable, unrelenting force um, that's kind of present in so many things from art, literature, language. And so tonight, I kind of hope that we can delve a little bit deeper with Elvia um, to unearth some other perspectives or shed some light on how the weird operates. Um, so yeah, one of the main driving forces behind the exhibition, Elvia, was actually um, your text for a literary hub titled Toward a Theory of the New Weird. And in it, you kind of trace the lineage of the weird in writing from the old weird and its opposite, the new weird. So maybe we can start this conversation by telling us a little bit about that research and how you maybe come to undefine the new word. Thanks, and thanks for having me. It's really nice to be paired also with Eric, who was part of the last talk, because I think we have a lot of complimentary things to say about um, the weird. Um, 
I came to the idea of weirdness kind of sideways. I wrote a novel that some people called weird. And <laughs> so I was naturally curious to follow that train of thought. Um, and also some writers who I admire um, have been sort of flirting with these terms, um, new weird, weirdness. Um, speculative fiction is really on the edge of these kind of categories. Um, and I'm glad you said undefined because um, it's hard to work with definitions when the very topic you're dealing with is the undefinable, often experience beyond language or trying to capture the ineffable using these like clumsy tools that we have as people, um, like story, um, for instance. And um, uh, basically I can just outline briefly um, the best um, book on the weird or the best compendium that I've found is this uh, book by Mark Fisher called The Weird and the Eerie. He uses these terms by, um, he defines them by walking through works of literature, art, movies, and music um, that express or act out the terms, as he says, um, which I do think is one of the best ways to do this. Um, and he talks about weird as an outside space, that which does not belong, um, generally zones of experience and types of encounter that rupture the categories that we organize the world with. And we have no choice but to then um, basically say these categories fall short. Um, and you can explain these experiences through drug trips or um, dream states or illnesses, mental illnesses, but ultimately um, what they point to is a kind of um, world beyond human experience. Um, and so in terms of literary categories, just to kind of speed along, um, the new weird, it defines itself um, through a bunch of work that literary scholars and writers have done against um, a kind of weird fiction that emerged at the start of the 20th century, end of the 19th century. Um, Lovecraft is the author who always comes up. He came back into popularity um, in the last decade or so. Um, and um, yeah, H.P. Lovecraft, he wrote The Call of the Cthulhu, which is kind of this quintessential story about this tentacled squid-like creature who comes back from the depths of ancient time and overwhelms this main character, um, sort of destroying the concepts of reality that he lives by. Um, New Weird, in my conception, has the potential to do something different rather than suggesting this scary outside zone to, for instance, Western male experience. It could offer alternatives for thinking about what is weird in the first place, how we draw those lines between normalcy and otherness, um, and help us question things down to um, the cellular level, so disrupting the category of humanity itself. Yeah, I think within that text, there was so much that we kind of, that we took as reference points. And I think I'd, I would like to talk about some of them tonight, namely language or lack thereof to describe or undescribe. And also like the idea of the feminist lens and what that really means in like the new weird and new fiction and maybe the new digital word. Because I suppose one thing that you did sort of elaborate on in this text is this idea that there's this perceptual flip of seeing the inside of reality from the position of the outside. And I, I feel like that's also something we should definitely talk about in relation to the exhibition. But first I kind of, I kind of want to bring it right back and maybe take us back two decades to, to where this really um, also really began. So alongside your text, the exhibition takes in, uh, inspiration from nostalgia of the early nineties sort of internet hunts and this idea of finding clues or hints to explore different internet domains or in our case, explore different works that have been uploaded um, to various sites of communication, you know, these kind of like community spaces. Um, some of them are old, so we used a lot of various platforms. Yeah, some of them are old, some of them are new, some of them are unknown. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really know of a lot of them. We worked with a great guy called Sam who kind of helped us traverse this land a little bit. Um, but yeah, as Jan Robert said, viewers kind of go through this exhibition by looking for hyperlinks to other sites that are embedded within the work. So um, of course, like within this, there are so many instances for a viewer to get lost. Um, the links kind of present themselves but only slightly present themselves and other times are completely hidden other times they're hidden in plain sight so you know this was a very deliberate decision you know we actively wanted visitors to get lost along the way and to to allow for their curiosity to take them down an internet rabbit hole so 
you know, the hyperlinks were really at the at the forefront of our thinking for this show. And and you know, there's they're, they're super important, obviously, but I think they were even more so important in those early days of the internet because according well a site wasn't really complete without links to other sites you know it was like this very peer-to-peer network of of building up information yourselves and kind of linking it via web rings or other methods so you know links are one of the web's most defining features but but one that's in decline now I guess because of like the platform's attempt to recirculate users within their own walls as it were you know everybody wants to keep people within the platforms to get as much content sort of get as much advertisement as they, as they can to their users so um so yeah so I guess thinking about the way that the exhibition is formatted and how many of the works kind of reference early internet graphics and early internet art maybe you want to speak a little bit about this predilection for nostalgia because I know that when we spoke on the phone this was something that kind of excited you a little bit like thinking about how nostalgia maybe has surfaced in your own writing and where that is in relation to the weird. Yeah I find this idea of nostalgia very fruitful especially when thinking about the aesthetics that emerged from your exhibition making um, and I think something about this format of like a sprawling sort of ever present, but maybe constantly changing network of links that can lead you to dead ends or lead you to unexpected places maybe that aren't even part of the show. Um, I think that it's interesting um, and curious that along with that, there emerged an aesthetic sensibility in many of the works that um, does reference earlier 0.0 versions of the web, whatever one we're in now, I'm not sure. Um, and um, for me, that suggests that um, it's, it, to, to use the term digital weird seems appropriate because these um, categories for how we think that the internet works and how even your browser and your desktop and your hardware work, um, that these are actually relatively recent constructs that we take for granted um, and we rarely um, question them anymore. Um, one reason I like to look at the early text-based internet of the early 90s, which was actually a really dynamic and exciting social space where people, people were role-playing and creating message boards and virtual worlds, and you could really do a lot with text commands, um, is that I completely forget in my daily life that the image-based internet was not available for a long time and that um, imagery and the kind of accessibility or supposed transparency that imagery affords, um, the illusion of transparency and accessibility um, is, is something that um, when the internet was first invented wasn't really on the table at that point. Um, and um, the anonymity that was allowed by text-based interfaces um, is very different from the kind of corporatized commercialized internet that we have today where um, if you're anonymous, you're assumed to be a creep or a bully <laughs> or a hacker, um, not that you are experimenting with identity play. And you know, a lot of artists, I think in the exhibition are working through visual um, means to question this kind of pinning of self to identity or performed self online and trying to explore that gap between the body and the self as performed online. Um, so I don't think it's a coincidence that there are a lot of like odd explorations of embodiment um, in the show um, because that gap again is kind of where weirdness lives um, where the, um, the construct that we find on the internet and assume is the way things are, um, is actually very constructed and with very deliberate <laughs> um, goals in mind by a, a certain small group of people. Um, so disrupting those expectations, the monetization of performance of self, um, the extremely rigid platforms for communication we have that in general prioritize um, imagery as much as, as much as I prefer Twitter. I mean, I can't say that it's, it's not itself a designed image-based interface. So um, anyway, I think weirdness resides in that gap between the body and the um, performance of self um, and sort of highlighting the fact that those, there's actually a real opacity there rather than a transparency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that kind of, 
there is there is a I guess there is kind of a notion in maybe like body horror or viewing the body as a certain other kind of weirdness um like an appendage maybe that's unrelated to your mental being um and I think one of the works that shows this really well is digital excreta's work in the show um we've uh, so this is like there's a couple of works as a still and there's um, a video as well but you know these are where the augmented vision of reality is kind of simultaneously strengthened and transfigured via this understanding that the internet allows us to envision a new version of ourselves right so it's like this untethered version um, that's not related to a physical state um, and I think that's, that, that is very important I think it kind of links to what you're saying about opacity and kind of transparency of identity as well um but maybe we can take a look at um digital's work jose if you've got them if you've got them ready uh spell check let's go with spell check Cool, thank you. And I, I guess I'd also like to say that if anybody watching has any burning questions, please put them in the chat. Um, Sanika will, will keep an eye on that and we can ask them either during the talk or at the end. Um, but just coming back to the work, I mean, this kind of like untethered feeling, it reminds me of the sauna scene in Oval um, where the main protagonist, Anya, is speaking about the bodies of others in the sauna space. And she's kind of describing this dichotomy between natural and artificial. And I think it, I think you or Anya perfectly describes this weird encounter that Mark Fisher talks about again of seeing the outside inside. So maybe, maybe we can speak a little bit about the difference um, between the outside body and the inside body and, and maybe a little bit more about where the body kind of comes in because there's a couple of other works that also are very sort of body heavy, let's say. Yeah, well, I can talk a bit about that in my fiction and I think other fiction that um, deals with contemporary body horror, which I do think is a bit different um, because we're aware of the horror of the planetary extinction happening at the same time that we're aware of our own bodies in space. And it's very hard to make connections between those um, cognitively. And it's also very hard to have physical contact with what we know is happening to the world. Um, of course, we all make contact with it in different ways, some people more than others, but um, you can't actually experience climate change, you can only experience the weather, which is something that the theorist Wendy Chun has said that I quote ad nauseum, because it's hard to remind ourselves that, you know, the climate is actually planetary, um, and we can't access planetary self. So um, body horror, to me today, um, so is actually the horror of that discrepancy. Um, which is to say that um, the, there's the sauna scene that you mentioned in my novel where the character is having this like crisis about like what size is my body? What, who am I in relation to other people? How am I supposed to understand myself in this ecosystem of this microcosm of, of a sauna at the gym? But then this sort of zooms out frequently in the book where we're looking at weather patterns and we're looking at like large interventions in the urban landscape and climate shifts and urban planning shifts and the, there's a, a, a siren and a honking, sorry. Um, <laughs> so the idea for me was to sort of um, deal with the, um, the pain and the difficulty of not knowing where your body fits into an ecosystem, meaning what art could you cause that could have a real effect positively or negatively 
Um, and um, what does it mean about yourself now that we understand that bodies themselves are ecosystems that are intimately tied with the environment when you think about the porosity of the body in relation to you know, simply pollution or now everybody understands probiotics and stuff. So we understand that we are um, multitudes, um, but what does that mean? How do you go through daily life thinking that? Um, and I do think there are some works in the exhibi uh, exhibition that kind of suggest this um, discrepancy, um, which I think, yeah, I don't know, maybe there's one we could show. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe um, Adam Faramawi's makeup tutorial is one because we kind of watch him parody this makeup and beauty culture scene um, on YouTube. It was a it was a commission by uh, Channel Four Random Acts, um, but instead of makeup, he's using paint. So he's kind of he's kind of going through this process of change, um, but in a very kind of obvious, very tongue in cheek way. I think. Um, but yeah, maybe we can play that one actually. That's um, Adam Faramawi. Back to school. Okay, so now it's time for a full body highlight. I generally do this using shaving foam. Starting at the mouth, extending out over the nose, cheeks, forehead, over the hairline, down over the collarbone, and let's not forget the hands. Tips for healthy skin and pleasure. These might not be the most subtle tips, but a lot of us are smoking, including e-cigarettes, not drinking enough water, not sleeping enough, not eating a healthy diet, not working out. Working out is great for your skin because sweating helps your skin purge itself. An awareness and a dedication to bringing pleasure to the body is considered a healing act. I already knew that, so I yanked the flower by its roots. I ran away singing. Yeah, so as we could see there, Adam was kind of unfolding before our eyes. He's kind of turning into something a little bit alien, maybe a bit more amorphous, a bit more organic in his appearance than before. Um, and he uses the, his, his own body and bodies a lot in his work. Um, he really likes to inhabit commercial scenarios, um, which then take a surreal turn. Um, so in this way, you know, the body inhabits or performs different identities, I guess. So um yeah, so I think, um, you know, the, the positioning of like this incidental um, that we, we were kind of talking about earlier and the incidental encounter is something that we gravitated towards in making this show, you know, how encounters online can often feel random or encounters with artwork can feel random, like you've stumbled upon something that you maybe um, weren't looking for. So I think... Yeah, in this way, the, the works perform this sort of disruption. You know, there's a, there's a contradiction here, maybe in terms of the intent or agency over delivering a random encounter, because it's kind of similar to the idea of being disrupted when you want to be disrupted. But but I guess with that being said, maybe we can talk about like a dis the disruptive nature of the weird and, and how this can be a positive or negative disruption and how that kind of maybe also fits in with this performativity that, we, that we've seen in a couple of the works. Sure, yeah, I think that one of the um, most um, important elements of the exhibition is this disruption of web space, um, which again reminds me of the way the early internet worked just because it was so much less um, governed. So there was a lot of room for glitching and breakage. Um, and a lot of that was really fertile ground for early internet artists to explore. Um, which was this kind of like, what happens when a link goes wrong? Does it matter? Do we update? And this is also a really big issue for preservation, just not to go off on a tangent, but is it proper to archive a site um, in its static form or should it be allowed to degrade like a natural object? Um, and I do think those questions are prescient when it comes to this exhibition, because as you encounter works through like the central hubs, it is hard sometimes to tell what's an artwork. It's hard sometimes to tell who the author is because uh, there are comment threads. Um, and I, I find this to be, yes, an important disruption of um, a lot of 
a lot of the taken for granted art world stuff, I guess, um, which was again, the intent of a lot of early internet artwork um, was to disrupt that um, hierarchical form of presentation and authorship. So I think self-presentation, we could also think about as this disruption of authorship um, and allowing works to circulate um, in non-monetizable spaces or spaces where they can take on a life of their own and become autonomous objects. So I think of that, um, that meme work, which I really liked. Please remind me the name of it. Um, it was it Kid Zanthrax. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was um, really uh, enjoyable. <laughs> and I love the lack of pretension um, because... Um, yeah, it just, um, it reminds you that none of these systems for producing cultural artifacts are in fact immutable or, you know, we could actually co collectively do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you, when you talk about that kind of um, disconnect or disruption, I think that, I think as much about the systems of um, the art world enshrining objects as I think about um, the disruption of the internet space, if that makes sense. Mm, mm. I mean, this was one thing that we kind of, we came, we kind of came to heads with during the, the, inst the installation of the exhibition, let's call it, because we'd, Jan Robert and I, we'd gone through all of the works and kind of chosen very specific platforms with which to host them and all of this kind of stuff. And we'd, we'd got a show and then we left it up for a day and we found that maybe two works had been taken down. We'd been banned off a platform because we weren't using it in the correct way. So it is this kind of, it is this weird gatekeeping of, I don't know if it's knowledge, I don't know if it's experience, but there's some sort of weird gatekeeping that's now present in a lot of um, these platforms where, yeah, you can't link out um, and you can't show certain things or you get banned from other things. So I think we definitely we definitely kind of took this glitching on board and in fact the show still glitches like it's been live for six weeks seven weeks now and it still glitches like we still have to make adjustments to the run of the exhibition which is kind of interesting I think it's you know I wonder if if this would have been the same maybe in the 90s if we would have tried to make a show like this I mean I'm thinking about like earlier Leolina's trailblazers do you know do you know that kind of that competition that she runs with Dragon and um, Epson Child like it's it's this competition where it's an esport basically which is also super fun um where a group of people come together and they have to get from one web page to another and they're only allowed to click on the links um so you know it's this kind of weird it's this weird sport where it's the fastest one it's the fastest person to click um within this space but I think you know coming back to the glitch like this is, yeah, this is a very kind of pertinent topic at the moment, I guess, with Legacy Russell's glitch feminism and all of these ideas around glitching. And of course, everybody spent so much time online over the last couple of years. Like we're all super aware that Zoom glitches, sometimes our internet is really bad. So I think we're more accustomed to that now. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I was listening to a lot of talks that you gave over and you, you were talking about this, were you talking about Tom McCarthy's Satin Island and this kind of idea of um, the holding tank or like this bug that disrupts and brings the system down. So yeah, I'm thinking about how this relates to the exhibition and how it's been mapped and, and remapped, as I said. Throughout the run, um, you know, there's been constant maintenance and I think we had to kind of let go of the idea of how the show, how we wanted the show to look and kind of just keep maintaining it. Um, I don't know, like just, just to make the works play essentially. But, you know, this breaking down of links is something that is, that I found to be referred to as link rot, which I think is a really nice turn of phrase um, where a link fails to the, to point to its original target, you know, so it kind of renders itself obsolete. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe we can talk about this moment of glitching and kind of how this maybe 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 the glitch is what goes in the gap between something being a weird encounter and something being maybe reality adjacent or real. You know, this kind of this moment of glitching. Um, how does this kind of evoke the weird? Does it evoke the weird? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think in the gap. Uh 
you often find uh, an instance when time is arrested or those direct connections you imagine to be real are arrested. Um, there's a new book by um, uh, Jonathan Lethem called The Arrest, which is about, um, it's a novel about a, an, a world where the internet broke and what, what everyone is doing afterwards. And I like that term, the arrest so much because it's like arrested in motion um, where suddenly you're in that buffering zone. You're like in a permanent buffer. And that's um, that term Tom McCarthy uses in his novel, Satin Island very frequently um, to describe the glitch. But the reason he uses the buffer um, as he's explained um, to me is that um, the buffer, like the icon that you get when something is buffering actually has no correlation to the thing that's happening, right? Like, mm -hmm. like if you have also even one of those like loading screens, which is like loading like a, a bar at the bottom or something, which is supposed to correlate with how much it's loaded, like that's not usually at all related to the amount that the information has loaded. Just as the buffering screen, it isn't really telling you anything. It's a moving icon or a static icon that says, wait, um, but that sort of weird, like it signifies that time is passing or that something is loading, but that's really all it does. It doesn't actually give you information. Um, and I think that that's a really, that's a really kind of odd and, and weird moment when you suddenly realize this is an image of, this is a representation. This isn't actually information about a process that's occurring through code or through something I don't have access to. Um, all it can tell you is that you know, wait, something's going to happen. <laughs> um, so mm. certainly um, that's a bit different than a glitch. I think I wouldn't, um, I mean, that's a design interface. That's that um, if you look at it a certain way, like say you look at the inside from the outside suddenly that, that you realize is quite weird. Um, whereas a glitch sort of um, often forces you to face the construct of experience. There's that saying that um, infrastructure is only noticeable when it breaks. Mm. Um, I can't remember who somebody had a, I think I stole that from someone. I feel um, like, it, yeah, like uh, you only notice a pencil's mechanism when it breaks, or you only notice the mechanism of a pen when it breaks or something. Yeah, in regards to infrastructure space, it's um, like the Wi-Fi router is a good example because you rarely think about your router except when your internet is slow. Right. Um, and infrastructure is that stuff behind the walls, like the plumbing, the electricity, and the Wi-Fi, you know, in the air, like how do we imagine these things working? Um, and when they glitch or break, we suddenly think about the fact that infrastructure space is all around us and that it's actually very, um, um, designed to be invisible, I guess. Mm -hmm. So glitches are important um, online and off. I think like, um, and I do think, I mean, we could talk about glitch feminism a bit. I do think that um, like we, um, we think we touched on there being like a feminist aspect to weirdness. Um, I would say potential feminist, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there are a lot of ways you could, you could replace the word weirdness with queering and in certain mm -hmm. kinds of like gender studies contexts, I think that might make sense, um, which just means to take, you know, a non-normative take on a set of um, social constructs and to um, look at them through the lens of an formerly othered experience um, and sort of to center a different experience. Um, and subjectivity, um, which I think, um, you know, the idea of, of glitching can also potentially do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what you were saying there kind of reminds me of the talk, this talk that you gave called Death, Death by Landscape, The Weird Outside, which of course is the name of your, of your new book coming out, but it's, the title's taken from this Margaret Atwood story. So yeah, this 1990s story of the same name, it's told from the perspective of, yeah, this surviving woman who decades later realizes, um, or she, well, she's obsessing over these landscape paintings, right, in her, in her house. And she's, she's kind of saying how they open inward onto a wall, not like windows, but like doors. So she's kind of thinking of them as being maybe portals to another world. So yeah, well, eventually, I guess, I mean, I mean, you can probably describe it much better than I can, but she sees her lost friend in these paintings, like her, her dead friend, she sees her in these paintings. And I think in the end, maybe the paintings become her or she becomes the paintings. But, but I think what's really nice about that story is that the death in at the center of that story is actually not a death at all. But I think you, you kind of framed it as being like this, this twin becoming of girl and plant. And I think that's also something that you touched on in that essay that I mentioned at the 
beginning, you know, this kind of these multiple instances in science fiction, in yeah, science fiction films, science fiction literature, where there is a very heavily, heavy sort of feminine presence, but it's also very much linked with nature. So this kind of like merging of um, figure and landscape um, and then this kind of, again, another perception flip, um, which I think I see in, in Adam's work quite a lot. I mean, Adam is male identifying, but, you know, he's he's kind of parodying this, this predominantly female authored space of makeup tutorials. So he's kind of, he's already adopting a persona, I guess. Um, so I think maybe the question here is like, do we see this transformation of, like female and nature as being inherently weird because I know that you know you kind of you mentioned Annihilation um both the film and the book and also there's a couple of other stories as well that you mentioned where women women become nature and and that kind of thing so is this is this rebirth into nature a death or is it is it weird? Is this invocation of weirdness even valuable? Like, how do you kind of position that that thinking of woman becoming nature, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I've got another loud truck, excuse me. Um, I don't think there's anything inherently feminist about any story, uh, depending on how, or any, any narrative, let's say. So woman becoming landscape is in many ways could be seen as a typical woman as nature, man as culture kind of divide where um, women go back to the land, women commune with the fertile natural ground. And in, as Donna Haraway would say, women become another natural resource to be exploited. So this connection of the feminine and the natural is, is tricky. It's not something I wanna like be a proponent of in general. What I'm interested in are stories that do this, um, that suggest a becoming of woman and landscape or plant or non-human entity ecosystem um, that are this is extremely loud on my street. Oh. <laughs> that are um, that are able to suggest this as either deliberate, um, like a deliberate transformation that is actually a reclaiming of something um, and an acceptance of um, of change as part of life. Um, or as something really joyful so that this would not be like a subjugation narrative but this this would be like a pretty um pleasurable exciting becoming something that isn't human um and that it would go both ways so some of the stories i talk about like karen russell wrote a short story called the bad graft which is partially told from the perspective of a plant that enters a woman through um it accidentally inseminates her through a little thorn um, so I'm just as curious about what it would feel like for non-humans to become part of us as the other way around. Um, so again, that's kind of moving, I'm, I'm using these, these stories to think about moving beyond this um, idea of woman becoming or woman being penetrated to the idea of human becoming or human being penetrated um, by the outside world and how this could actually be seen as a form of labor um, that anybody could take on or learn to, you know, learn to share the labor of reproduction, which is to become plant. I mean, not to zoom out too much, but the life cycle um, does mean sort of like, you know, there is a return to the earth and also a fertilizing of the earth. Um, and always, you know, breathing is a part of creating an atmosphere shitting is part of creating the atmosphere, dying is part of creating the atmosphere. Mm. Um, all of these processes could be seen as world making. Um, and mm. we could step away from quote unquote natural reproduction to think about world making in that way. But I feel like I've strayed from some of the digital space that we were talking about. Um, so I guess I would just um, wanna talk about some ways that the that internet digital um, culture is naturalized and treated again as a landscape that um, is the backdrop for human actors versus um, a landscape that we are all co-creating voluntarily through labor, whether or not we like it. There is like an aspect of um, co-creating the spaces that we inhabit um, mm. and, and thinking about, I would like to think about ways that we could do that work differently. Mm. I mean, I think, I think what you were saying about um, 
nature landscape and these kinds of things I mean it's something that I notice a lot in Oval like the the Anya and Lewis kind of live on this this ecological mountain called I think it's called the Berg right and their whole house is like this eco house and and towards the end there's some weird stuff happening with um cartilage architecture and houses and these kinds of things and I think that's very much tied to technology which of course is tied to the digital but um I guess maybe thinking about that and thinking about the world that you created or the kind of a, like reality adjacent world that you created in Oval maybe it will be a nice segue to talk about some of the works in the show that, that also do this very similar thing of, of worlding or kind of parodying fiction or fairy tales so um one of the works that I've loved having in the show is Cassie McQuater's um, feminist dungeon crawler game um, called Banshee. We've actually got one level of it in the show, but it's it's such a great game. And I think it really kind of shifts that focus of um, a very male dominated space in the 80s of like these very early graphics games to being something that's very, maybe not pro female, but definitely kind of from a from a female identifying perspective, which I think is it's super important, um, especially in that space. So I think maybe, Jose, if we can take a look at um, Cassie McQuater's um, Banshee real quick. Yeah, so maybe with, with Cassie's work in mind, um, we can talk about this outside space that we've been coming back to a lot and, and its relation to the digital or like these new digital movements of virtual reality or role-playing games and how that kind of also interjects with persona creation and, and worlding for want of a better word. Um, sure, I mean, um we could definitely talk about that in terms of gaming or the gamification of self, which cuts both ways. I do think um, the gamification of self is what leads us to self-help Instagram and um, kind of constant performativity of optimization and endless to-do list apps and workout apps, et cetera, et cetera. But then there is this kind of um, lingering gamification of the internet, which I think your exhibition brings to the surface, which is the simple fun of exploration that can happen in digital space um, and a kind of gamification, um, which um, is maybe like latent or simmering <laughs> in, uh, in the world of hyperlinks. Um, there's still a thrill I think I get from following links down rabbit holes. I think it's still exciting. Um, I was playing this Wikipedia game the other day where you have to get to, you, apparently you can get to philosophy on Wikipedia if you click the first nine links that you come across on each page. Um, and I was just thinking like, what a miracle this, like, this is really, there's something miraculous about this. And it, um, it still feels like um, there is exploration to be had amongst the cracks um, and on like message boards and stuff, which is where some of the work um, is enacted in the show. Um, those are actually, I think, some of the most lively places um, where people mm -hmm. can kind of go wild, which are incidentally mostly text-based spaces. Um, but thinking about, we'd also think about gamification in terms of the performativity of the self um, in terms of like um, what it means to play a role online and how um, we, I mentioned earlier this um, odd gap between the body and the identity people choose um, to inhabit, which often looks like, it looks like the same as the self on the driver's license or the ID card, but it might actually be very different. It's always jarring when you meet someone in person who you know online and they're totally different than you expected. Yeah. Um, so in very small ways, this performativity can happen, but also in very creative um, 
and exciting ways that are very generative um, and also sort of enter the self into this um, sphere where other selves are role playing. Um, and um, again, role playing was really popular on the early internet. Um, that was one of the best ways people had to interact in virtual worlds. Um, now, I guess you see that mostly in like video gaming, um, which, um, I also think offers like a huge realm for creativity and like discourse even um, in game worlds. Um, although I know less about digital gaming worlds than I know about offline physical gaming worlds. So I don't know if I can speak to them too much. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, like um, especially on Fortnite and stuff where you can you can you can have an identity you can create any identity you want but you got to be prepared to pay for it because you got to pay for the skins you got to pay for all of these kinds of different things and I think that was something that I mean it was I guess it was prevalent in um a second life you know you had to buy your plot of land and and these kinds of things but I feel like now it's maybe much more about commercialization of, 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 of like skins or of names or of these kinds of things um, and kind of really trying to sell them, sell them to younger, to younger viewers who were just kind of like taking their, my mom and dad's card or whatever. But, um, um, but yeah, I mean, for sure, like this idea of kind of adopting um, personalities online, I think it's because you can, you can hide behind the screen. The screen is the mediator between yourself and, and your audience. So you can, yeah, it's liberating. I think it's liberating. And I think a lot of the artists in the show are kind of, they're also playing to this idea. And, and I think Jan, Robert and myself also play to this idea because none of the works in the show have um, the context of art around them. They don't have any signs or signifiers as being of being artworks, right? So they they have like these randomly assigned usernames um, and these kinds of things. And and the only the only way that you can actually know what a work is is if you download, is if you enter the exhibition via the the direct download for a start, and you get a copy of of the booklet, and you can kind of see you can see people's works in the booklet. I think for us it was really important to kind of have that separation because I think that separation allows for more people to maybe have, I don't want to say more genuine experiences with the work, but I think if you're just kind of stumbling upon a work um, in the show, I mean, it happened. It happened on one of the works. We've got um, Casey Kaufman's collage work on Nine Gag, which I'm sure Jose can bring up in a sec, but, you know, it's kind of this work, we, we put it up there maybe a month before the show launched and we had, we, had, we already had like three or four comments before the exhibition went live of people just being like, what the fuck is this? Like, I do not understand what this is. And kind of just it being it being adopted and being part of the internet language, like people were posting memes about it in the comment section. And I think that was just, that was really interesting for me to see that because these were people that did not know what, what the show was. The show wasn't complete by then. So there wasn't a link to kind of progress. It just kind of existed on nine gag. And I think that's, that's really special. I think it kind of points to what you were saying about, um, you know, go still being able to go down these weird internet um, rabbit holes. I mean, Sam, the guy that we work with, Sam sent me so many weird sites that I had no idea that existed, of course, because there are millions of websites. Um, but you know, these websites like stinkymeat.com, which is just this guy posting photos of like bits of meat that he finds. <laughs> like, you know, I think the internet is, is, can be this space for like every single thing. And I think that's, that's super exciting. Um, but yeah, yeah, Jose, maybe you want to show Casey's collage work if you have it quickly. One thing I think about when looking at these like um, mysterious or like little known corners of the internet that when you enter them turn out to be like super popular <laughs> um, is um, the experience that I had when I first started um, 
learning code, I guess also learning how to navigate the internet sort of like organically. Um, but when, I guess in the mid 2000s and 2010s, I learned to do basic coding, like really basic HTML, CSS, PHP, MySQL, things nobody uses anymore. Um, and I was so struck by how these um, early coding languages and really like the most basic substrates of a lot of the internet really last longer than a lot of the um, like, you know, everyone knows like flash is a terrible idea, but like <laughs> things that emerge later on and things that are much more popular now, um, they break a lot more often, they're more likely to fall offline, languages change more quickly, so things become obsolete way more quickly. Um, I have a friend named J.R. Carpenter, who is um, an electronic literature master and has been making code poetry since like, I guess the 90s, maybe earlier. And um, wow. she, she calls um, HTML the cockroach of the medium, just like zines, like where zines will inherit the earth because they will live longer than any kind of high literature form, similar to these like really robust basic HTML hard-coded pages with leaks. So I've always, when like making things online, I've always been really attentive to, for instance, Olia Lialina has like a guidebook for how to make proper websites that she wrote like 20 years ago. And like one time I made a website and she wrote me and she was like, you've made something that is not a hyperlink blue. I need you to change this. <laughs> And I was like, she's totally right. Like, why would we lose this like common visual language? It's so basic. Um, and I do think like, I'm always interested in returning to those basic building blocks of the internet, um, which I think actually allow a profound weirdness to emerge as much as anything else that's complicated. And one thing I really like about these, like, I guess sort of like the descendants of like bulletin boards, like those meme pages or like nine gag that we were just looking at is that they really do feel like robust and long lasting forms of stuff. Like while the images themselves might degrade or disappear, that conversation is likely to stand for a really long time. Um, and I really like this like record of a time that you can access in that way. And a lot of it, I mean, just the form of a conversation or like a thread um, does become like a, an interesting kind of time travel where you can follow something all the way back. Um, and that is very different from other kinds of time experience. That's like a very specific temporal um, mechanism. I had a question as well um, about the, I think I was um, thinking about what a weird encounter often is. It's very much in the now it's, uh, this, this, these disruptions are very um, sort of in, in outside, exactly, body and outside. They're sort of now, they're very, they break with every conception of norm. So uh, they're very performative. They're sort of, they're not frozen, but they're dynamic. So it's, an, it's an, a moment evolving. It's very, um, and as soon as you don't do that, as soon as you recollect, you start putting, blocks on everything, you sort of fall back into the norm, normalization of, of life and you can do it on a social level, personal level. And I, I always found computers very much to be like beautifully analogous to life because they're also performing, they're performing machines and they're sort of staging this sort of quaint solidity, but actually that's why the glitch is so nice because it sort of breaks that illusion and sort of oh, you sort of see the performative machine sort of um yeah stumbling um and that was so great about the 90s it was such a, a free open place i i think that that that's i, I totally get the nostalgia so what i wanted to say is i'm super curious to hear you about because there is it's very frustrating to see how the net has been plat platformed uh which is really solidifying this space, this performative space, it's becoming, it's all about content, but the sort of this, as we sort of ontological space of the computer space is very much restricted by boxes. And these boxes are becoming more and more narrow and less. And the latest step of course, has been um, the immutability of the NFT space. So now we're, we're making boxes, which will last forever. And they're more, even more solid. It feels even more, 
boxed and the performativity is even being killed. So it's now they're, they're sort of little diamonds set and uh, unmutable, which feels so paradoxical with what the machine is, but also in a way what life is and what where weird was the weird moment. It's it, I, I don't know. I don't know. I find it difficult to get that. I don't know what your fish. Maybe you have some wonderful insights. <laughs> Um, I can't promise wonderful insights, but I did think of, of a lot of things while you were speaking. Um, I do think this like frozen NFT object is a sorry, a sorry end. <laughs> I hope, I hope, and I'm also sure that it is not the end point because artists and everyone will continue to make things that don't make sense within these categories and within these systems of commodification. Um, and I think that's already happening. I mean, right now, I think we're in a kind of a gamification phase where people are trying to make the system work in their favor, you know, all the best to them, like <laughs> that, that has to happen. Um, but I think soon we will enter a phase where things get way weirder. Um, and and if people do things with NFTs that we're not expecting, um, undercut their authority, um, probably find ways to um, make entirely new blockchain systems that are communally owned by artists, for instance, which was something that we dreamed of in the mid 2000s. I remember being, I, I remember having a lot of conversations about, could we make an NFT that was like an artist's social security system? Like, could we all contribute to like a blockchain for communally owned art? And there were lots of ideas that sort of fizzled because people didn't have the resources to put behind them. Of course, the people with resources to put behind them would rather invest in a static object NFT. So, you know, there was, a, <laughs> there is as always a gap between the dream and, and what became realized. But I do think now that a lot of these um, technologies are in place and the protocols are solidified, I hope and think that there will be room to nudge them and um, upend their authority in this way. Um, and whoever is making a living off it right now, like, I hope that is good and continues for them. <laughs> but, but we also have to remember that most people will not benefit from this. Like most creators will not. It is not a democratizing situation. It's, it's a consolidation of wealth. Um, and that is, it, it's, not, it's not what there was potential for. So I don't actually think it's a retrogressive or a romantic nostalgia to look back at earlier phases of the internet. I don't think I'm glorifying what that space was. There were also a lot of awful things that happened to people in early internet spaces. But I do think looking back at what people, what was just, what, what was possible because the medium was um, less technologically advanced and less commodified and what it could have afforded earlier on is actually a very, um, it's, it's a utopian gesture, but it's also a practical one. Um, there are really things that we could pick up on. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is natural language processing. So like uh, GPT-3, like this um, pretty advanced tool for generating what um, what appears to humans like pretty natural language with a lot of problems. Like it's certainly not perfect, um, but it can respond to questions. It can learn about what you sound like and then imitate your speech patterns. It can write a new Shakespeare sonnet, this sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of discourse about computers beginning to talk back to us. Um, and I think that there's also a super potential for weirdness there when we think about um, actually listening to what the computer has to say instead of trying to force it to imitate human language. Um, and um, also allowing it to do things that are not useful for us, allowing it to be creative um, on its own terms. And then I also am just really interested in this idea that computers are talking to each other all the time in a way that humans have no access to which is profoundly weird that there is some, um, you know, like if you have a smartphone and a smart fridge, they are probably in communication all the time unbeknownst to you and you wouldn't be able to read their language. So I think there's also this thing about language that is not for people, that is not for us, um, which of course you can reverse and look at, you know, go back to the idea of landscape and look at plant communication, it's not for us. We can't actually interpret what plants are saying. We can't speak their language, but we can be fairly sure that they're communicating. Um, I did take that far from your question, but it was very damning. <laughs> Sanika, any, anything up on the online? 
No, nothing happening. I was just wonderfully thinking of Steiner when you talked of this uh, last bit of like using the computer in unpredictable ways. And there's an interview in which she says that she wanted to build a software that had always an unpredictable outcome and no one wanted to help her build it because everyone was like, why should we do that? So it's so fascinating how this poetry is so beautifully embedded in her practice. And I think Jan Robert and I always come back to the Fasukas at one point. <laughs> But no, nothing happening online. People don't be shy. Elvia is still here for not all too long. So hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask questions. Uh, there was a thing that I, I wanted to uh, maybe also involve young Robert in answering this question. And this is if the this freedom of anonymity and building your own identity that we found in the early web is maybe now happening in more in game environments, since you're very knowledgeable on the early web, but also on, on, game, on games in general, also of contemporary games. Do you see a possibility there of reclaiming identity and playing creatively with identity in a less restrictive way? Me? Yeah, you, you're... you're... <laughs> I don't, I, yeah, I'm not completely, uh, I was never a big gamer. So it's not my expertise. I'm more interested in the, um, I would say, more the surroundings of games, the, the space and the materials. Um, so I was never really into the identity aspect of it. There's way better artists, uh, fascinating, did fascinating things. Not, yeah, not in your practice, but in your knowledge of games that you happen to have quite a lot. But maybe they're also always tending now that I rethink of the games that we spoke of to the more architectural side yeah. than the than the um, but even that maybe like um what's his name the game um that you can be everything is actually maybe a good example yeah. of it because yeah. that also that, that, is, that is actually a really nice one of shifting identity becoming a planet becoming an object uh, yeah that that's a very helpful one uh, and games are super good at that. So I, I agree with Elvia. There's there's still so much space there. It was, and I think it is. I mean, it's such an. Uh, if, if anything, it's the simulation engine. So it's if it, it is, it's a wonderful place for high weirdness. If you if you go into the game spaces and and the thing can be simulated and the perspectives and and everything is warpable. So it. it mm. uh, it is, yeah, it's an incredible space. And of course, the, the normative culture there is so heavy because of the big bucks going around and the, and the traditional mm -hmm. sort of uh, teenage boy heavy uh, audience. Um, and there's, there's good steps being done, but there's so much still to be done. And it's, it, it, yeah, that's immaculate. Um, so I expect, expect a lot come from there. There's definitely like, uh, I've noticed a lot with younger artists, like this need to create games or be involved in making collaborative games. And I don't really know where that comes from. Maybe it comes, maybe it just comes from like the community, the communal social kind of aspect of gaming. But I think just to go back to your point about like, a, like identity within gaming, I don't play a lot of games either, but the games that I do play tend to be kind of simulation games. So when I was younger, I would play Grand Theft Auto, but I wouldn't play it like how they wanted you to play it. And I think a lot of people actually don't, you know, they kind of find ways to play it that suits them. And and I'm, I'm wondering if actually we, the more we play a game, the more we kind of play a character, it doesn't matter if that character looks like us or not. It doesn't matter if we've chosen that character or not. I feel like we kind of, we become that character. Like I also play Stardew Valley and I got to choose my character, but the way that I run my farm and the way that I like go down in the mines, like it's how I would do it. Like, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just trying to think about like, if it really matters if you get to choose what you look like or if like just even playing through, like going through the motions of playing a game really allows you to become that character and kind of adopt that persona. And um, maybe there's something weird. There's something weird in that, right? Yeah. Think, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, it's fine. Um, okay, I can. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, I think there are different kinds of games. So um, 
uh, I do think that the idea of landscape is actually really important in a lot of games and a lot of people do play them um, for the beauty and the immersive experience of being part of a, a landscape that isn't our own. Um, we could talk a lot about VR in those terms. Um, but um, yeah, for instance, I played the Spider-Man game, which was really just about this incredible rendering of Manhattan um, rather than collecting points. Um, just like exploring that and like flying through it was amazing. Um, but when we're talking about like um, social networks and gamification in that way, it makes more sense to talk about stuff like World of Warcraft, where people really do talk to each other, form teams, do a lot of crazy cooperative stuff, um, where social dynamics are really present and um, people do often not tell the exact truth about who they are, or where they are, or, you know, what they're doing. Um, and I guess that would for me be more of like a legacy descendant of like early um, role-playing games online. Um, but it is more complicated when your real voice or your real location are involved. Um, and in, in those games, it there are also higher stakes, I think, to what avatar you choose because you can clearly have some discrepancy. Um, but I think artists are using the idea of game space um, exactly as you say, because of the desire to create social spaces of of also of play that really can't be ultimately commodified. Um, and also to think about the way that social worlds affect art worlds and other worlds. So um, the group that produces the game is sort of inherent to the game because um, the players can't be separated from the characters and the game design is kind of part and parcel of the ethics of what happens in the game. So. Um, to me, that drive towards gamification is a drive towards community and sociality, but also a drive towards discussing the ethics of what it means to make stuff in, um, in outside spaces, weird spaces, which art can still um, allow, I think. Mm. That reminds me when you were talking about that, about um, your research or your interest in um, the artist placement group and kind of why artists are maybe bought in or co-opted by companies and, and who are they producing for? I think in one of your talks you mentioned like, or John Latham mentions this like third invisible um, actor in this, which is not the artist, it's not the company, it's just invisible person that maybe we now associate with being the audience. Um, so maybe, maybe you wanna speak a little bit about that because I, I remember finding that super interesting, I mean, I'm from the UK, but John Latham wasn't really an artist that I knew so much about. And especially this artist placement group, it seemed, it seems to me quite radical. It's quite a radical thing to do in the sixties to place artists within, within groups like this. Yeah, so what the artist placement group did in the sixties and seventies um, and maybe onward, depending on how you define their practice was to pick artists and put them in context of corporations or industries and have them produce something. But their rule was that it couldn't be for the benefit of the artist or for the industry. So it had to be um, completely non-beneficial for anyone. Um, and so there was this kind of Venn diagram that emerges um, when thinking about the client here, where it's not the artist, it's not the corporation or whatever, it's this invisible third person who John Latham, who's one of the protagonists of this group, um, calls like the invisible third person, but has, yeah, has often been called the public or the audience. And so in this text you're referencing, I'm trying to figure out who that invisible third person could be today. Like, do we think that the public exists as such? Do we think that humans should even exist as such um, really like questioning that Venn diagram, which I think is still extremely useful because the other experiments that combined art and industry, art and technology, art and corporations that happened throughout the 70s, 80s, in um, especially in California, like um, art and technology or experiments in art and technology, which were two different groups, which put artists like Robert Irwin or Rauschenberg um, or Warhol, they stuck them to NASA or they stuck them to like um, the Rand Corporation and they said, make something awesome, which clearly had clients. Like they wanted to produce value for the corporation and they wanted to produce value for the artists, their careers in the art world. And this, and it seems to me that a lot of the time the invisible third client got lost. Sometimes it was, it was, you know, kind of remained because the output that they imagined was a conversational experiential output rather than um, making something. 
Um, but this is really an important topic today, I think, because the amount of artists embedded, not just in corporations, but in tech corporations, um, thinking about artists' effects on digital space um, is uh, pretty frequent. I mean, the idea of having an artist in residence or an artist consulting or an artist hanging around and doing something with Google, with MIT, whatever, Facebook and, you know, Autodesk, they all have artists in residence programs. Um, so I think it's probably not an, un like artists tend to talk about the stuff as like fringe to their career, but I think it's becoming more central, um, which means interesting things for digital space or not, depending on how powerful you think the artist is in that context. That was something very, uh, oh no, go ahead, Rebecca. I think you have something popping up. Um, but that might be a very conclusive question. So maybe I'm too early. Uh, anything still bubbling here? No, because I was I'm sure we can tack on to your conclusive question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, um, um, but you can also say no, but I was really curious sort of, um, so yeah, you know, the elements of the new weird or, or what, what was your, motivation to write your upcoming book. Um, is there anything you want to tell us about it? Oh, that's a kind question. Um, <laughs> and also a cruel question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so the book is called Death by Landscape. So it was um, inspired by or began with a talk that um, has been referenced a couple of times about um, becoming plants um, and sort of um, also thinking about self-death, world death, planetary death, extinction, um, as um, trying to reframe things as a becoming um, rather than either like reverting to a pre-Anthropocene moment when everything was fine or fast forwarding to a post-human future when everything is different and it's a space opera and really trying to be here and now during the process of extinction um, and trying to imagine ways that um, the world is transforming for the better and the worse um, and not just see it as a death or an end point. Um, and um, yeah, the rest of the book, um, it deals with um, plants a lot, plant language, computer language on opposite ends of the spectrum. It deals with this idea of extinction, both grand and personal. So I deal a lot with trauma and trauma discourse um, because there's this term in trauma discourse, extinction burst, which is a last burst of post-traumatic response that happens right before you move past it, um, which I find really interesting kind of in relation to the way that we talk about the planetary. Um, and then um, I end a lot talking about um, games actually and live action role play um, and sort of like being reborn through the process of a game. So lots of things we talked about. Yeah, exactly. It's everything we talked about. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, wait. So when is it coming out next year? Yeah, next year. I've got to wait like, I don't know, nine, 10 I months. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. It sounds really good. <laughs> Thank you. Sonic, I feel like we cut you off many times. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally fine. <laughs> I um, just think it was indeed quite a conclusive question, and I think it's <laughs> I think it's rounds it nicely up. So I think this might be the moment to have a last look at the chats, both on Linear and YouTube. But no one seems to dare. Okay. <laughs> I guess. Well, maybe maybe we can finish with one of I think the best works in the show in terms of how it was displayed because this was an incredibly long process of getting this work um, to kind of look how the artist wanted it to look and to kind of go with the concept that the artist had. And that is Nikolai Schmeling's work. So Nikolai's work is hosted on Jitsi. Um, and when you access it, if you click, if you like toggle the gallery view, you can see three instances of a video work that are playing at different moments. And this directly mimics Nikolai's kind of conception of the work in real space. So it is really this blurring of IRL and URL, I guess. Um, and I think it was, I think it was a very interesting part. I think it is a very interesting um, work for the show in the way that it kind of takes you through this um, disembodied viewing experience. So maybe we can end by showing that. But I just wanted to thank Elvia so much for taking the time and, and kind of being part of this really interesting conversation around the show.
Yeah, thank you so much. It was a joy to speak with you. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so Lina. much. Thank you, Arba. It was a great pleasure doing this two programs with you and so for everyone at home don't forget to watch the show if you didn't do it yet so go there before september 6th i think it was and i think there's actually a new show coming up in the gallery already tomorrow yeah we okay. have a new show a new physical show opening tomorrow it's called software for less and it's a solo show by american artist ben grosser so we've commissioned four new works as well as showing a whole range of his other software um, works as well. So if you're in London, do pop by. We're open from six tomorrow. I, I wish I could see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, everyone. And I think we just say bye and leave everyone at home with the last piece of the night. So thank you all and see you next time.